Okay, hello everyone. Today we are going to go over the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. And this is a subject that I have been personally interested in since I visited Sicily years ago. Um, my brother was in the Navy, and him and his family were stationed there for, I think, six, I want to say five or six years, um, a while. And, you know, and so I would see ruins, I'd go to all these towns, and, you know, you you kind of get a sense of all the great history there on the island. And when I came home, I would try to research, and I'm a huge documentary fan, obviously, and lectures, and you would never really find too much about it. And as you dig deeper, you kind of see the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies itself as the formal incarnation was um, really not too vast of history and facts, and it, it, was, it was quite short-lived. So to really understand it, you kind of have to go back hundreds of years, really, and kind of pick apart everything that led up to this, this time period, which was really just the culmination of all the things that were prior to it being formed. So, with that being said, this will be part one, and I'll kind of cover all the precurs precursory, you know, levels, and then in part two, we'll get into the actual formalization of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, or more adequately, Kingdom of Both Sicilies, but we'll get into that later, and the aftermath, and how that set up the region for the future, and the region being um, southern Italy, below the Papal States of the time, and quite obviously what we now know today, the island of Sicily itself. So, without further ado, so this would be the Old Kingdom of Sicily, and so they were reunited before, which... It consisted of the island of Sicily and, as I had previously stated, southern Italy below the Papal States, as you can see here. And they were united under Roger II of the Normans. And so at the time, up until here, the Normans had occupied, as you can see, the island, southern Italy, as I stated, and then also parts of North Africa. And really the Normans, I mean, they, they'd occupied a lot of Europe at the time, but... Up until now, you know, we're, we're mainly just focused on, you know, the Italian area. And so, you know, you had Roger II, who, you know, he was crowned in 1130. And, you know, this is like the big famous cathedral relief of him being crowned and anointed by Christ himself, which was huge. And so this was a big deal because he just managed to unite all the... Norman Italian conquests into one centralized government. And so this was the first time. And as I said, this was in the 11th century. And so this is really the beginning of when you had the island of Sicily being joined with mainland Italy. Before this, I mean, you know, Sicily has always been bouncing around hands. Um, it was a part of an Islamic caliphate before this. And you know, so this was a big deal in, in the history of not only Sicily, the island, but its relationship with mainland Italy, you know, in general. And so, and one of the bigger things that he did was in 1140, he had the Assises of Ariano. And so this made the king the only lawgiver and both judge and priest of the nation. But, you know, and that's kind of, you know, neither here nor there, um, pretty standard. But at the time, it made all Sicilians equal and under the same laws, which was really quite quite a big deal for the island, because um, as I said, it was quite varied. Um, so you had the native ethnic group, you had, you know, the Arabs and Muslims there, as I said, from previous generations, um, Lombards were there, um, Greeks were there. So you had all these various types of, you know, ethnicities, races, what have you, and so now they were all kind of united under the same laws, same you know, excuse me, the same constitution. And so that was a big deal. And it also demanded that commoners be treated justly and not just overburdened and oppressed by their lords, which was a big development considering the feudal society of the time, you know. And economically, it introduced new coinage, which helped facilita facilitate trade with the rest of the Mediterranean. You know, and it was smaller denominations, which made for more accurate conversion rates, which you know, obviously was, you know, quite impressive for the time. And uh, so the primary export was Durham wheat. And, uh, you know, th this increase in trade throughout the Mediterranean due to this new coinage 
really facilitated developments in agriculture and, you know, it made stronger political and military standings and it, you know, really supported the merchants as their trade increased. And, um, you know, it really just led to stronger markets for the region, which, you know, obviously was a big deal. And we'll get into that later. You know, how hundreds of years later that that still was kind of showing in in southern Italy and also the, you know, the island of Sicily. So, you know, Roger II, he's, you know, support, I mean, a lot of arts and cultural aspects of, you know, the island of Sicily and also southern Italy are still apparent. Um, you know, that's that's something what they're more famous for. But even governmentally and economically, Roger really had a prolonged effect on the, you know, what was to come for the region over the next, really, millennia, almost, quite frankly. And so, eventually, the kingdom passed into Hohenstaufen hands, um, not very long, less than 100 years, and it passed through to Hohenstaufen through, I believe it was Roger's grandson's aunt who married the German emperor of what was then the Holy Roman Empire. And, you know, the so there were issues there with the Pope not wanting the kingdom to fall into Germanic hands. You know, whatever, that's neither here nor there. But it didn't last long. It only lasted, like, I believe 60 or 80 years. And then Charles of Anjou got help from the Pope because of that issue to invade and kind of overthrow the Hohenstaufens there. And, you know, that kind of, you know, kept kept them united under Anjou until the War of the Sicilian Vespers. And so there was unrest in Sicily because of their place in the Angevin Empire. I mean, they had no share in their own government. They had extremely high taxes, which were more or less used by the dynasty, the ruling class, to finance their other wars abroad. And so, you know, and, and there's this big misconception that Sicily was just backwards and dirt poor and all these kind of things, when in reality, I mean, they, it, it was really quite a wealthy province to have. And so, you know, when under the Norman rule, they really had all the, even though it was still a foreign power, they, they had quite, they, they were treated fairly well. I mean, they, they really weren't mistreated too poorly under Norman's, you know, that my research led to. I'm sure there were instances, but overall, as a whole, they didn't have too much to complain about. But under Charles Anjou, things were just absolutely not good. And so the rebellion began on Easter of 1282 after sunset prayer. And that's where the name comes from, you know, Sicilian Vespers, Vesper being the prayer time there. And, I mean, in six weeks, 3,000 French were killed. And apparently it all began from, you know, the legend goes, a French, if you would go back to my last clip. So a French, uh, an Angevin soldier, they harassed like a married you know, Sicilian woman, and that just kind of enraged the peoples, you know, but overall, quite frankly, it, um, it, it'd been brewing for time, and they just, you know, you just have this streak of the island Sicilians who just never quite, you know, want to be ruled, and, you know, it's hard to, hard to really argue with them there, so, Anyways, so in six weeks, 3,000 French people were killed, and the Sicilians reached out to the Pope and wanted to be, you know, a sovereign state, similar to what you had in Venice, you know, for a time, and perhaps Parma, similarly. And, you know, the Pope was French, and he told them, no, I'm not going to do that. You have to, you know, recognize Charles as your sovereign ruler. And this was just politics at its worst, quite frankly. Um, you know, at the time, that was not uncommon. I mean, the church was obviously very heavily involved in politics, especially for the region. And so after the French Pope denied the Sicilians their free state plea, they sent for Peter III of Aragon. And, you know, his main claim was that his wife was the daughter of a former king of Sicily, Manfred. So, you know, he, he, he kind of used that to his advantage. I mean, it was really neither here nor there. I mean, because he was of Aragon, which was Catalonian, which was Spanish. 
and so you know you see this recurring theme of kind of you know French factions versus Spanish factions throughout throughout the history quite frankly um, even with the Norman rule you know the Normans were from Normandy which is northern France but from here on out you really see it between competing factions of the same houses of France and Spain origin really battling it out and um you know so anyway peter the third comes in he's crowned september 4th 1282 you know mere what is that from easter six months after the war of the sicilian vespers and um you know he promised the privilege the privileges of the former norman times and from that the people kind of you know accepted him as you know hey it's that's better than the alternative under the angevines which is really not fair to us at all whatsoever and so at this point, the Old Kingdom of Sicily became split. And by the Old Kingdom of Sicily, you know, that would be, again, southern Italy below the Papal States and then the island. Okay, and so you had the Angevine Kingdom of Naples. And you will have the Aragon Kingdom of Sicily, which from here on out will be the island of Sicily. So up until here, the Kingdom of Sicily was the entire unit. Correct, and then at at this split, where you had Angevine mainland and Aragon island of Sicily, this is when they start to become known as Kingdom of Naples and Kingdom of Sicily. But historically, you know, the predecessor Kingdom of Sicily was always the United Kingdom. Okay, the United Realm. But hereafter, you know, they get kind of divided, and then this will also lend to when they finally get reunited, which we'll discuss in part two, that it becomes the kingdom of, you know, really the literal translation, the more accurate translation would be both Sicilies. You know, I mean, we call it the kingdom of two Sicilies in English, but I believe the literal translation is the kingdom of both Sicilies, because the kingdom of Naples was always kingdom of Sicily as well, you know, and... So at this point, we have the split of both of them. And, um, you know, they'll get reunited again under King Alphonse of Aragon in 1442. And then they'll be divided again in 1458 at Alphonse's death. And then briefly in the 1700s under Savoy and Austrian powers, they'll be reunited. And again, you'll just kind of see this back and forth of mostly French and, and, and Spanish, you know, factions with some Austrian Habsburg um, influence thrown in there as well. So now we'll get into discussing the Kingdom of Naples, you know, the separate kingdom, now as it's called Kingdom of Naples. And so, as previously stated, it's the Italian peninsula south of the Papal States, you know, and it resulted from the Vespers, and now, you know, they're separate from the mainland. And for much of its existence, it's contested between French and Spanish dynasties as well of it, on its own. And, um, you know, so you have it being ruled by the Habsburgs from 1714 to 1735. But then it becomes reconquered along with uh, Sicily by the Spanish army during the War of the Polish Succession, which... Um, you know, really was just, a, you know, your classic medieval European power struggle and it didn't last last very long and so you have the two kingdoms here again of naples and sicily having a personal union under the bourbons and habsburgs but they remained constitutionally separate okay so that's important to note they weren't formally unified you know and, and you'll see this recurring throughout their time as i previously mentioned during the habsburgs and during Alf you know the reign of king alphonse you know they'll <sighs> And it's it's more so they're possessed by the same people in in an aspect. I mean, in this time period, you know, duchies and provinces were just collected by, you know, the the great powers of the time of the region, and and it was not uncommon for them to switch hands quite frequently. But anyhow, so in 1799, the French army captured Naples, and they installed the. Um, Parthenopean Republic. That's a bit, a bit of a tongue twister there. And so the Parthenian Republic, it was led by cultured upperclassmen, which, you know, sounds good in theory, I guess, but in reality, it soon found itself in financial difficulties, unable to form an army, unsuccessful in democratic reforms. And, 
you know, so it was it was really quite quite difficult. And what you had was, you know, this came out of after the Bourbons fell to the French in 1799, the lower class, you know, they had riots, they rebelled, and so the Republic was installed to avoid anarchy by the nobility and the French Republicans. I'm sorry, Rep- Republic. Yeah, Republicans. Beg your pardon. I'm uh, misreading my own notes here. And and so this was just, you know, another another example of how overall you get the feeling that, you know, Southern Italy and Sicily especially, they they really sided more with the Spanish factions than the French as a whole, it would seem. Um, you know, and you have various instances of the French kind of mistreating locals, as was discussed in the War of the Sicilian Vespers. And just just in general, just, they, they didn't want to accept change all that much. And there's a couple of hiccups that, you know, are exceptions to this, which I'll get into later. But overall, you feel like they really felt, you know, a loyalty towards the Aragons and the Spanish Bourbons. You know, the various... Just, you know, the various Spanish overseers, rulers, lords that they would have. And so the Treaty of Florence of 1801, it really reinforced France as the dominant power of uh, mainland Italy. And so in 1806, you had Joseph Bonaparte, who would be Napoleon's older brother, was named King of Sicily. And that didn't last very long. In 1808, he would be... Replaced by Joachim Moreau, who was, I believe, Napoleon's brother-in-law, the husband of his sister. And at this time, Napoleon's elder brother would go to be king of Spain, coincidentally. But so Murat, you know, in 1814, Napoleon was defeated, right? And at first, you know, his brother-in-law, Joachim, he had reached an agreement with Austria to retain the throne of Naples. You know, but then during, I believe it was the Hundred Days War, he had realigned himself with Napoleon and went to war with Austria in what would be known as the Neapolitan War in 1815. And now, they obviously use the term war quite loosely in these days. It lasted one week in 1815, but it ended with the Battle of Tolentino and, you know, Ferdinand the fourth ended up being restored to the throne of Naples and Joachim I believe was executed after this which is not surprising considering he made a deal with Austria to keep his throne and then turned around on them to side with Napoleon again and start a war against them when he had originally been allowed to retain his his realm there and so you know that's not really anything anything particularly surprising to happen to him and the next year we would you know it would go on to be the kingdom of the two Sicilies being formed more on that later. So while all that was going on in the Kingdom of Naples, you had the Kingdom of Sicily, which it was ruled by the House of Savoy from 1713 to 1720. And that, you know, was short-lived, but that's something to remember because the Savoys will come back into play later on in the history. And... You know, the Savoys lost control at about 1718, but they didn't actually fully relinquish their power to the Spanish until 1723. And so, from here we have a few changing of hands. So, Sicily was traded to Austria by the Savoys in exchange for Sardinia. And Spain was defeated in 1720, and Sicily belonged to the Habsburgs, who had already ruled Naples at this point. And this is one of the instances where I said that they you know, were possessed by the same people, but they were never really formally, um, you know, combined. And that's because they both had different histories. As you can see here, throughout a course of, I mean, maybe 40 years there, I mean, it went from Savoy to Spain to Austria, traded back to Spain. I mean, just, you know, a whole a whole mess, quite frankly. And so, you know, so 1734, as Naples was re- reconquered by King Philip V of Spain... Starting that branch of the House of Bourbon, you know, you have that same year, Sicily being traded by Austria to the Spanish back for the Parma and Tuscany duchies. So again, as you see here, the island of Sicily just, I mean, it gets pinballed around. I mean, it's just a plaything. It's a toy, right? But it's not all bad um, because under the Spanish, I mean, this really opened up economic flourish as well as social and political reforms. 
including public projects, cultural initiatives, directly started and inspired by King Charles V, who was the son of Philip, who had reconquered Naples, as previously stated. And really, Charles the, the I'm sorry, Charles the Third. I apologize. So Charles the Third really was the best thing that could have happened for the Kingdom of Sicily, quite frankly. Um, started the first glass recycling program. He protected forests. He started a pension. He, I mean, did so many wonderful things. It really is, you know, qu quite impressive, quite spectacular. I believe the first railroad in Italy was started by Charles. Um, he was just really what they needed and you know as you go through you know the kingdom of naples and the kingdom of sicily i mean he he just did so many cultural things various palaces and gardens and just all these things that are huge nowadays you know all stem directly from charles and so you know years later so charles's son ferdinand you know acceded the throne but he was uninterested in matters of state and most of those reforms pretty much just came to a halt you know, it's fair to mention that, so Ferdinand, he, he became king at a young age. And so when he was young, obviously not interested in matters of state and really unable to rule. And so you had this kind of classic scenario of somebody else in the court kind of taking over, you know, various other people taking over to sit on the throne for him while you know, he's in his, his, his young age, right? And so, you know, in his absence, Naples and Sicily really grew closer with Great Britain and more so away from Austria and Spain, which, you know, isn't necessarily a bad thing. So in 1799, as Napoleon conquers Naples, Sicily became the base of Great Britain in the Mediterranean in their struggle and war against Napoleonic France, Right? And, you know, during this time, you had Lord William Bentinck, who really became a big player in Sicilian affairs. He was a British ambassador to the court of Palermo. And as I previously stated, as King Ferdinand was young and wasn't really involved in anything at all, you know, he was a guy who really stepped up and really did things for the island kingdom. And the biggest thing of this was, you know, they modernized the Constitution under his guidance, the British guidance, and it led to the formation of a two-chamber parliament. It ended, you know, feudalism more or less after the Napoleon defeat. Ferdinand came back and repealed all of this, repealed all reforms. And, you know, it, it, it's really unfortunate, um, you know, because you had this period of Charles III really making all these great strides economically socially but not really politically and then that bridged the gap to you know the british helping f politically democratize more or less you know you know really bring them into the modernization of 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 what politics was becoming you know throughout liberal europe and you know so you know so fast forward so ferdinand gets to be of age he takes the reins back and not only did he stop all of these cultural and economic reforms that his father had, had had started and really initiated. Now he also repeals this this quite wonderful and modern constitution that, you know, Lord William Bentinck and the British had inspired and helped, you know, helped formulate. And so this is really a big blow to the island Sicilians especially. And, you know, and this will be a recurring theme that comes up later with various revolutions and rebellions that, that occur when they really want to be a sovereign state and self-governed and that seed was really planted you know obviously the normans you know hundreds of years ago planted that seed but it, and then it really grew again between charles the third and also you know as the napoleon wars were going on the british presence in the court of palermo and just on the island as, as a whole you know really opened up island sicilians eyes at the time and you know so you, you could argue that even though the Sicilians did have a, you know, a strong loyalty to, you know, the, the various Spanish rulers, um, you know, this, this British influence there really, really kind of set, set the stonework for what would come later in the various revolts and rebellions and what would end up being issues that they would have in the future with the, the Spanish ruling, ruling houses.
So at this point, that, that's the end of part one. And in the next part, part two, we will discuss the formation of the formal kingdom of the two Sicilies. More appropriately, the kingdom of both Sicilies. And um, just, just what occurred during that. And then the downfall. So thanks for watching and stay tuned for part number two.